Welcome to the 34th episode of the sixth season. The, of the 38th ab- episode. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to oh, the yeah. 38th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to interview Alan Bell yeah. about Raspberry Pis. And we've got another time-saving tip and we'll read your feedback. If you're listening or watching live, you can send messages using the chat facility on the website. We need to reword that. (laughs) In the IRC channel, I'm Mark, and joining me this week are Tony. Hello, Mark. Glad you came to me first. Alan. Uh, Yes, hello. And Laura. Hi. (laughs) So, Tony, what have you been up to since uh, last we spoke well, I'm very glad that you asked, Mark, because I have been baking biscuits in aid, <gasps> in aid of my... Which you can try. Uh, you can try now if you so. want. Um, they're rather nice. Let me just open the box. There we go. I Tony opens the box. You won't be able, he's not those. even showing people on the webcam. This is, this is terrible radio. They are, are, they so, are chocolate orange chip biscuits. Which so, I'm yeah, we can just about see those. In yes. aid of my, uh, my so, Malawi um, fundraising so. trip that I am going. Oh, hang on. Yeah. So right. these, these are for charity. You, you, can eat them, you can eat them for free. Um, <laughs> these are the prototype ones. <laughs> But yeah, Hang I'm, on. I'm doing anything I can to raise money. <laughs> They're fine. I don't so. eat prototype biscuits. Any, sorry, you said you're doing anything you can. Well, within reason and the bounds of law and taste. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we'll soon see about the bounds yeah. of taste. So yeah, you can have a biscuit. I'm going to pass it to Alan now. There you go. Enjoy that box. Excellent. So yeah, that's basically what I've been doing. So uh, <laughs> I, I, what, I tell you what, since I've mentioned it, I might as well put a link in the show notes. To oh, I that. see. I see what you've done there. Mission. Oh, they do uh, smell good. Which is for, you know, helping improve healthcare in Africa, which is a worthwhile cause. So feel free to give me any money um. <laughs> <laughs> that you have spare. So Laura, what have you been up to other than uh, being subjected to Tony's Bakery? Uh, learning Java. Oh, wow. lucky you. Uh. No. Uh, <laughs> what have you been doing in Java? Nothing yet, just learning it. <laughs> um, you're trying to, well, following a tutorial lab thing, but because tutorial lab things don't teach me, I've actually just been taking the code that they've been writing, right. typing it in, I see. and then translating it into an English comment alongside each line. Interesting. And spending hours Googling the web. <laughs> is this, <laughs> to a, find is this a work thing or a university thing? Um, it's. At work for work, right? Because I work with Java now. <laughs> okay, so aren't there Java developers that you work with who could teach you this? I don't want them to teach me. I want to learn. Are you implying mm. that you won't learn if they teach you? Yes, <laughs> yes. I don't because okay. then they go at their speed and not my speed. Okay. And having chatted about this slightly this this evening just before I left, um, I had to get through what level of concept I was at. Right. They were like, oh, no, no, that's just easy. You just do this, this, and this. And it was like, a bit like Santa's little helper on Simpsons going, whoa, 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 class. Hmm. Op- object-oriented is hard. I've, le- yeah. I've tried learning Java so many times before. I've bought books on it and all sorts. But it, I want to do it. I've just not had the impetus before to keep going so i was like that with ruby on rails yeah, no. i bought a, the more lots books, of books the more books i bought the, the theory would be it would eventually be easier to understand but it doesn't I, I, I did that with python right i have a massive stack of python books isn't yeah. python I don't all right why though you all find it so hard <laughs> isn't python all it's right it's just though? a programming language yeah. <laughs> with a snapper yeah yeah but, but we, actually, i see i get basic i get PHP, to, you know, I, and I can hack other people's. I haven't really started from scratch. Have you done, have you done objects I've, in PHP? No. If, you see, uh, try, this is the thing. I've not done objects. Try stuff. learning objects in PHP, then the objects in Java will probably make that, no sense. No, because. No, I do that. <laughs> see, I, I, I've done a little bit of pearly scripting, so I can do the regex stuff, but not Java <laughs> objects. I think Alan and I both got lost after 10 print hello. 20 yeah, go I did to that as actually well. move and draw i've been reading an excellent book uh this uh this week uh and it's called 10 print ah oh, oh. yes it's superb and it's an entire book um about um a program that was written for the Com- commodore 64 years ago and the program is one line long and the whole book is and the analysis of this one line computer program and it's brilliant <laughs> Well, I did. I did a computer my computer badge at guides, and I wrote wow. an application for it in Basic when I was about fifteen. 
Sweet. So you say I can do it. It's just going to take me a bit of time. <laughs> Yeah. And that was 15 right. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> More than that. Well, let's uh, get on with the show. On the line, we have Alan Bell from Libertus Solutions. Hello, Alan. How are you? Uh, hello, Alan. I'm very good, thanks. <laughs> we this need, isn't going we need, to get confusing. <laughs> we need more Alans. <laughs> so uh, we know you from having past presented the show, guest presenter, uh, UK uh, Ubuntu Loco team leader, and um, general good egg. Um, and uh, you recently announced an Indiegogo campaign. What's that for, then? So the plan here is to uh, to build Ubuntu for the Raspberry Pi. And uh, we're going to build it on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we're going to assemble a big cluster of uh, about 32 plus a few uh, Raspberry Pi computers and um, build all of the source packages for Ubuntu that we'll build easily. So uh, why, why doesn't Ubuntu run on the Raspberry Pi already? So a bit of history. Um, when the Raspberry Pi was first uh, announced, um, and it was in development, and the, the shape of it changed a few times as they were working out how to lay out the PCB and everything, uh, they were demoing it running on Ubuntu, uh, yeah. specifically Ubuntu 904 Jaunty, mm -hmm. because that was the version of Ubuntu that would run on the ARM, um, ARM HF, uh, ARM 6 instruction set. That, uh, that they were using with the Broadcom ARM chips that, that Raspberry Pi has. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the last version of Ubuntu that will work on that chip. Right, because after that, the Ubuntu archive was built with newer ARM revisions in mind. So those, and those, pack, those packages won't work on a Raspberry Pi, right? That's, that's correct. It's, uh, they're designed for the ARM 7 instruction set, which is confusingly... The ARM's got two numbers so there's a, it's an arm 11 chip that runs the arm 6 instruction set which um, is thoroughly, thoroughly confusing Good. that's clear now it, it gets me every time it's great that the, the arm experts know all this inside out but it just, it's just <laughs> it just seems like a wall of numbers and the word arm in there somewhere <laughs> so so the solution to this is to recompile all of ubuntu's source packages on a raspberry pi that's right yeah without it costing um, an arm and a leg Indeed, or not too many arms and legs. <laughs> Specifically, not my arms and legs. <laughs> ah, hence the Indiegogo Which is what campaign. crowdfunding is all about. <laughs> so, in the, the campaign you've published on Indiegogo, how much are you looking to raise over what period and what are you going to use the money for? So, we're looking to raise uh, £2,500, uh, which will allow us to create a 32-node cluster at about £70 a node, including the Pi and the SD card and all the networking and, and shelving and so on that we need to put them together. Wow, something's going on in your house, I think. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's very um, excited about the crowdfunding campaign. Yes, clearly. <laughs> they are, they are, yes. Um, uh, so, and... Yeah, so two and a half thousand pounds is the is the target uh, amount, and the funding period is going from Guy Fawkes night on the fifth of November uh, through to the end of Christmas Eve. Which, uh, oh. oh, really? Oh, that's rather nice. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it ends midnight Christmas Eve. And the, is it? Uh, it's a flexible funding thing. So even if you don't hit the target, you still get the the um, amount pledged. Yes. That's right, yeah. Um, Indiegogo, take a slightly bigger slice of it if you don't meet the uh, target. It's a 9% okay. cut they get if um, if we get below the two and a half grand, and it's a 4% cut they take if we meet the target. So how near the target do you need to get to still be able to achieve something useful? Or will, it um, just, will you be able to do it whatever? It will just take longer because you'll have less, less pies running together. Fewer pies. Yeah, it, it, it'll... So at the moment, uh, the total is at, he says, refreshing the page, 626. Well, that's not bad. Since that's yesterday. pretty good after a day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's not bad. We're about 20% of our target. So. That's pretty good, yeah. I think the Ubuntu Edge campaign got to about 10% after that. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed. We've got four minutes into the interview before the Ubuntu Edge has been mentioned. Uh, and the number 32 million hasn't come up yet. Well done. Yeah. 
Not, not yet. <laughs> give, it, give it time. There we go. There we go. <laughs> so uh, w- um, w- once you have hopefully reached your target, do you just go out and buy a load of off-the-shelf pies and stick them in a shed in the end of your garden or something, or is there more to it than that? Well, it's, it's slightly um, more salubrious <laughs> than a shed at the end of the garden. I was just going to put them in a corner of, of, of our offices over the other, the other side of town. Okay. Um, but you don't need uh, any special infrastructure other than some space and some power sockets? Not really. Uh, we've got um, you know, a, a, an office um, that we can put it in. We've got power. We've got networking. Um, so are they, are they like network together in some clever way or are you just going to SSH into each one and say it compiling then do a different package on each at a time or is there something sort of clever going on there? It's the, the way you set up a, a Debian build farm is slightly cleverer. There is oh, a... <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's uh, a, a tool called uh, Wanna Build, right? And you run that on one of them, okay? And that is the queue manager. So it's got a list of all of the source packages in the archive, and um, and, it, or, and you've got another one which has got a copy of all of those source packages so that, that the builders can download from, right? And then you have a bunch, an arbitrary number of build build demons, build bees. And all of those can grab a package out of the queue and they'll say, I'm going to build this package. Um, and then they'll sit for a few hours and build it and then give it back. So each Pi is going to be running an instance of build D? Yep. Right, and okay. It, it will pull the source packages out of the, the, one, the one that is the repository yep. and go and build them and say, I've built that or I failed to build that. <laughs> and it'll go on to the next one. And do you have a particular um, preference for the packages? I mean, is it just going to be like start from A and work through to Zlib, or is, <laughs> you know, is it? Do you have a, a particular scheme that you're working to? Uh, I think we'd probably start with the main collection and then move out to universe and multiverse. Or, no. But main's still pretty big. Main, main's pretty big, yeah. And do you need all of the repository to run on ARM in order to have a successful distribution? Uh, no, not really. Um, so we don't know how much we'll build and how much we'll fail to build. Um, You're expecting some to fail to build then? Yeah, I'm expecting some to fail to build based on the, the fact that we've been told that um, you know, there are packages that, that assume an ARM 7 instruction set. We don't know what they are. We just um, we'll find out the hard way. Okay. And um, what happens so, if it fails to build? Uh, so it depends what it is and how important it is. Um, some we might leave. We're not guaranteeing to build everything. Right. Um, what what our main objective is to get something that boots and runs um, like Ubuntu server. Okay. So boot to a command line. Uh, you've got Python, you get PHP and Apache and stuff like that. Um, if we can get to uh, a graphical desktop, then that would be brilliant. But that's, that's a bonus. Uh, it's still a success if it boots to a command line and runs the same Ubuntu packages for server and embedded things. So given that um, Ubuntu doesn't, a current release of Ubuntu doesn't run on the Raspberry Pi, last one was like, like you said, ni- uh, 904. Um, mm-hmm. How... How do you plan to bootstrap and get the build Ds running, given you can't run Ubuntu on the build D to build Ubuntu? <laughs> There's a chicken and egg situation there. How do you get started, or how do you, how do you think you'll get started? So, yes, there is a, a chicken and egg situation, and um, I, I'm rather keen on chickens and eggs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I'm planning to do, uh, and I'm open to advice and uh, other suggestions, is to start with the uh, Raspbian uh, distribution so that's based on Debian Wheezy mm-hmm. and bootstrap it from that so we use Raspbian to build the tool chain and um, enough of the packages that um, that we're up and running and then uh, change all the build Ds to be running on that new built uh, bootstrap uh, and then build it all again so have you ever done anything like this before 
No. <laughs> he's, he's done the yeah. chickens and eggs bits before. Yeah. <laughs> We've with met that, them. With that no, it's, answer, it's kind, of, kind of an ambitious project, but there's, it's not just me involved. There's, there's other people who have had advice from all kinds of directions. Cool. Yeah, so uh, um, you've, had, you've had conversations with other people as a result of, of, um, uh, of starting this campaign. What, what have been the, like, the flavour of those conversations? Um, so there's been a lot of enthusiasm. Um, there's been a lot of well, there's been 16 people who've financially contributed, which is absolutely awesome. Um, and there's been um, a lot of people talking about it, a lot of people telling me how we should have done it instead. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what's, what's the, what's the flavour of those? So, so the flavour of those is uh, the Raspberry Pi is a terrible thing to build it on. You should have done it with X, where X is either QEMU on Intel x86 uh, systems that we should have emulated and done it. Um, you should run it on some other quad core ARM platform. You could, should run it on a Calzeda box. Uh, we should do it on the OpenSUSE build service. And these are they're, they're, all these people are right. It would be a lot <laughs> more efficient to do it a different way, but that's not the way we're doing it. But your, your head is firmly in the sand on this one, is it? <laughs> my, my head is firmly in the sand. I, I am listening to all of these suggestions with, with great interest. Presumably, uh, Raspberry in itself isn't built on Raspberry Pis. Uh, no, it's not, because that, that was built um, before they were generally available. Right. Uh, that, that's built on a sort of similar ARM um, platform, might be Panda boards or right. something like that. So um, why, why do you think it is important to build Ubuntu for the Raspberry Pi on a Raspberry Pi? Why not give in and use one of these quad-core ARM jobbies? Because uh, I don't really want a rack of quad-core arm jobbies in the corner. I want a, a rack of nice, silent, fanless R, 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 Raspberry Pis. <clears throat> okay, that's a good answer. Um, it's it's also a much better um, crowdfunding concept to, for people to get behind. People, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, easier to convince people to let you buy a load of servers than let you sorry let you buy a load of Raspberry Pis than let you buy a load of big, powerful servers. Yeah, the pitch is, hey, you love the Raspberry Pi, let me go and buy something else. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) So am I right in understanding that this will actually be um, some sort of Alan Ubuntu? You can't actually call it Ubuntu because it's not um, a sort of canonical blessed distribution. Well, it it won't be an Alan Ubuntu. Uh, (laughs) Oh. Bell (laughs) Ubuntu? Yeah, prob- probably not. Um, well, probably not anything with Ubuntu in the name. Uh, I think, uh, right. Canonical have got dibs on that. Um, there is one of, one of the perks, the, the big perk, so right. like Indiegogo say, you should have a big perk. Um, if for 1,000 of your British pounds, uh, you can buy the naming rights for the operating system. Well, that could go horribly <laughs> wrong. Yeah, there, <laughs> is there, is there yeah, sort of could. reasonable restrictions there, or is that open to all comers? Uh, the, the restrictions are uh, 50 characters max. I'm not, I mean, somebody... <laughs> name, and not containing Ubuntu and not containing rude words. Okay. Oh. As decided by... <laughs> as decided by me. Okay. Yeah. okay. No, I think that's very your project. Your project. Yeah, you get to. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah that's fair. So, and if, if nobody goes for that, then we'll pick a name for it. And um, yeah, if people want to uh, to throw out suggestions, then they're more than welcome to do so. Mm. So, if the if well, whether you, you whether you get the, whether you get the funding or not, by the time this finishes at Christmas, that'll be a lovely Christmas present either way. Yeah. Um, so then you've got to go out and get them and build the thing and then start actually building um, uh, the, the packages. What, what release of Ubuntu are you aiming to build? So we'll start with um, the current release, Saucy, um, because it's basically done, it's stable, it's new, and it's what's running on my laptop. Because <laughs> part of the objective of this is so that if I write something on my laptop and then I put that code on the Raspberry Pi, I would kind of like the Raspberry Pi to be running the same everything else as my laptop runs. Right, so it's consistent Mm -hmm. across your server, your laptop, your Raspberry Pi. Yeah, so I think we'll start with Saucy, um, then probably Precise, because that's the long-term support, Mm -hmm. and then Trusty, which is the next... um, the next release, 14.04. So that'll keep you busy for the next three years. 
It might do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it depends how many pies are in the cluster, really, as to. Well, yeah, I mean, if if you go, you know, way over your um, your campaign target, will you just, like, buy more, or will you keep some money back and then see how it's going, and if it looks like you haven't got enough capacity, then buy more, or, or faster network, or whatever? Yeah, one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, uh, yeah, a bigger cluster would be able to build more faster. Um, that that would be a, a good thing to spend additional monies on, should we exceed our target right um excellent yeah, otherwise other other infrastructure to support it and we could spend um you know spend more time we've got a crazy amount of money we could employ somebody to make sure that all the stuff that doesn't build from source builds oh, yeah it's ah, yes. a good idea yes. but that would that would be quite a lot of money over right. <laughs> <laughs> you might um you've limited it to only one person with naming rights haven't you you're not going to end up with like five people competing for the name there's there's only one yeah. right right okay cool okay well this is certainly something we've uh, we'll be keeping an eye on over the next uh, month or so mm, and, absolutely uh, yeah. look forward to seeing the results thanks very much for talking to us Alan and if Mark Shuttleworth buys the naming rights then he can call it Ubuntu <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that's special he's allowed Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> excellent well we'll put a link to the crowdfunding thing in the show notes and uh, we'll look forward to hearing yeah. from you good in luck. the future cheers yeah. then thanks Alan bye, bye. 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 It's time for another command line love, and this is a particularly nice one that we stole from a man <laughs> called Colin King, who lives on Google+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's, uh, it's to do with port scanning, which is basically seeing what services you're running on your uh, computer on, that might be ne- accessible over the network and potentially vulnerable to crackers and other evildoers. Or also looking at what ports are open on another computer. Oh, so not just self auditing, you might be trying to yeah. probe like, uh, somebody else's box. Yes. Or checking your server on your local network or your firewall perhaps. Oh. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty good. But it's quite a lengthy one. Right. Uh it uses Netcat hmm. to do a port scan. <laughs> okay. Okay, there are other ways uh, yeah, of doing port scans. Isn't, isn't there? there Nmap for doing port scans. There is. Nmap can do that. Which is specifically for port scans. As seen in The Matrix Mm. (laughs) and CSI and loads of other places. But this is cooler. Um, And it's really quick as well. Oh, right. Um, That's good. So, yeah, you specify a bunch of parameters. It's quite long, so we'll stick it in the show notes, of course. But, um, yeah, when you run it, it just nearly instantly just goes blam and gives you a list of all the ports that are uh, are open. It's really handy. So what does Netcat do? What is it? Uh, It's a way of transferring data i think mm. right. so it just tries to send like a bit across to that port and sees whether it's there or not well in general netcat can i mean use sorry for, in, but in this in specific this example yeah it just tries to send a bit to each one and if it gets a response oh. it uh That's quite it neat. succeeded and uh yeah it's very nice yeah but it's quick yeah super quick so mm. yeah i scan my machine and it's like under a second it scanned you know ten thousand ports on my local machine wow it's really really fast that is very good. Excellent. Well, as, as Alan said a couple of times, we're going to put a uh, link to that in the show notes. And um, then you can try that and try probing. Scanning your, your friends. <laughs> Scanning your friends and And why not write people. to us and tell us which ports your yes, friends have opened? write to us from prison and uh, tell us how the food is. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. it's time for your feedback and we have quite a lot of feedback because we've not been here for a while um so yeah we'll just see how far we get through it uh bruce byfield emailed us um and it was his blog post that inspired our odd camp live show discussion about the decline or not of ubuntu um and he yeah he sent us an email saying i admit that i downloaded your podcast half expectingly to hear myself pilloried for my suggestion that ubuntu might be declining instead to my pleasant surprise i heard a well-rounded discussion of the idea i ended up listening to the whole podcast and found other topics were discussed equally well i'm definitely going to make a point of watching for your future podcasts hello bruce (laughs) 
uh, we uh, with thanks for an entertaining and informative 50 minutes excellent well hopefully that we... might be the nicest email we've ever got yeah, yeah. hopefully yeah. we haven't wildly disappointed him with this episode <laughs> <laughs> It's it's like this most of the time, Bruce. Sorry, just to warn you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't usually go in depth, and uh, yeah. Uh, Gordon Sinclair wrote a blog post inspired by our discussion, making a few suggestions to Canonical. To me, Canonical are making a lot of we're doing it our way moves. They are big enough that I'm guessing for every person who's had enough of Canonical and Ubuntu, there's another new user to replace them. But a user is not a community member. They may still have the install base, but the people willing to contribute shrinks. It's actually a lot longer than that, the blog post, but that's sort of part of it. One of it. The gist, yeah. is it? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, it's, it's kind of one of the things we touched on in that discussion sec- uh, segment, actually. Yeah, indeed. And and also the, you know, Canonical are making a lot of we're doing it our way moves. So are some other people. Uh, you know, mm. uh, well, Android are doing it their way, you know. Mm. Uh, Tizen are doing it their way. Uh, Selfish are doing it their way. Fedora are doing it their way. You know, everyone is doing something their own way. And Frank Sinatra Pretty is doing it his way. way. <laughs> there it is. Oh, dear. Hamish, uh, oh, are you going no, on? No, yeah. no, no, I'm not. Okay. okay. Well, thanks hey. for writing in, Gordon. Yes, thank Mark, you. Why don't you read the next email? I will. Yeah, thanks. If you, uh, yes, just give me a moment and I'll, uh, I'll do that right now. Get Hamish right. down at email. <laughs> so. Your piece on the Ubuntu community, including discussion of Mark Shuttleworth's recent sniping about Wayland and System D, got me thinking. I really love that Ubuntu came up with its code of conduct. It's an awesome thing, but it needs to be upheld, and I feel Mark's last post is, at the very least, stepping beyond the spirit of the code of conduct. I'm not aware that Mark's apologised, and it's clearly caused distress to a number of respected free software people, and hardened feelings in many places, and that all seems regrettable. I came to have high expectations of the Ubuntu community over the year and my expectations are sadly being lowered as the quarrelling over Mir versus Wayland, Upstart vs System D go on. By all means, make your own technologies, but you don't have to attack other people who have different choices. Yep, I'm not aware that Mark has apologised anywhere either. Um, I'm not Mm -hmm. aware whether he believes he should apologise or not. I don't know. It's a fine line between sort of stating your point and, and having a creative discussion and what some people could then perceive as uh, abusive arguments. Shots, yeah, yeah, yeah mm. pot shots, cheap shots, whatever. Yes, uh, but I suppose when people are always taking pot shots at you, you know, I'm, I'm surprised he lasted this long before taking some back. <laughs> yeah. And it's not like he went completely postal. Yeah. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. To be fair, we do take a lot of flack. <laughs> Quite a lot. Yeah. I think he takes more than you. Uh, yeah. Although we could ask our listeners to redress that. But <laughs> <laughs> we give yeah. you quite a bit of like. Yeah, we do, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. How'd the Edge campaign go? Oh, yeah. Um, I've <laughs> Twice in one day. Gosh, you're spoiling me. At least. Yeah, well, I've got two weeks to wait. Uh, Ivan Payich emailed in to say, I doubt that Ubuntu is on the decline. It must be on, on its best ever. On the other hand, sadly, community looks to me at its lowest. Just scroll through the wiki pages and you'll see that it's missing input from the high-skilled individuals. I can point to outdated or clearly wrong tutorial, uh, but I'm not able to add a correct one. Also, I doubt there's been a lack of interesting, tough problems for high-profile devs to solve, but I do see auto-censorship and shooting down, can we, with rephrasing Mark's points, followed by don't bother trying. On the lighter note, Og Live Show was great, and Ubuntu SDK is outstanding. Oh, thanks, Ivan. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm glad you're enjoying some things that are going on anyway. (laughs) Romy Van Elst is giving away two Raspberry Pis every month for a year to people who come up with good ideas for them. He's emailed to let us know the winners of the October 2013 giveaway, which I've completely failed to write down in here. So we'll give you a link. One winner had the idea for a virtual assembly language and the second winner has an indoor home automation project. You can find winners here. It also includes pictures from the Raspberry Pis that are being sent. Uh, I sh- should <laughs> prove that he really is sending them. Yes, I say. I say the here's the, a photo of a Porsche that I'm not going to send you. <laughs> when I say you can find the winners here, what I meant was link in the show notes. Yeah. Right, and the giveaway page is also located at another link in the show notes. Uh, a recap of the idea: I'm giving away two free Raspberry Pis each month because I can, and because I like the Raspberry Pi and how it motivates to tinker and learn new stuff. I think I I know someone who can yeah. do with a, do with a free cluster <laughs> pie. A, a wacky or compile do, cluster. Uh, yes. A few rules apply. You have to they have to write down their idea, 
Put it on a voting page and every month two of the ideas with the most votes will get a Pi Model B with a case, SD card and USB cable for free from me, including shipping. What a lovely man. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. I, still, I still think that's an awesome idea. It, it is. is. It's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I look forward to seeing what other ideas people come up with. Mm. Yeah. Remy is actually, I think, the guy who wrote a blog post about um, uh, using um, Git and uh, encrypt uh, encrypt oh, FS thing. Yes, to, to do your own to, sort of... Yeah, make your yeah. own like Dropbox type, yeah, yeah. but encrypted. Yes. Hmm. Uh, also, uh, Paul Brown email from Finland about Code Club. I too have been inspired to start a Code Club. I do have a slight drawback in that I'll need to translate the material before I actually get my Code Club up and running. I'm working on that now. I have a question for Alan. Uh-oh. I'm just going through Wacker Witch and notice that after I have my witch moving back and forth on the screen and in the random appearing disappearing script for her, she seems not only to disappear and reappear at random intervals of time, but also at random places on the screen. I mean, if she's gone for three seconds, when she reappears, she's not necessarily where she would have been after three seconds if she'd stayed visible. That's perfectly okay for the game's purposes, but I just wondered, A, did you experience the same? And B, any idea why? Uh, yeah, I think so, because she's she's bouncing off the sides of the screen, um, and um, that's normal. And then she disappears and then carries on moving, for, and you can set the time that she disappears. and then, But she's moving and you can't see her. I mean, he's saying that she doesn't reappear where he would expect her to reappear. She doesn't disappear and then reappear at the point where she was on the screen. She disappears mm. and then reappears somewhere else, because when mm. she hides, she doesn't stop moving. No. She's a cunning little witch. Right. <laughs> and it, 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 yeah, it's an actual witch figure. It is a witch. Yes, yes it's a witch right. on a broomstick with a purple hat on, I think, and mm. a knobbly nose. Right. Yeah, it's got a lot of detail in this scratch yeah, game, you know. Absolutely. Stereotyping. Yeah. It's, it's, it's worth, uh, yeah, having a look at... Uh, if you look on Git... GitHub, there's a, um, a code club group on GitHub, and you can you can grab the tutorials, and somebody else can have a go at Wacker Witch, or you can also translate, uh, much like he is. Cool. Attila Miali Balash, I hope I got that right, uh, emailed about the optician who mentioned in episode 33 about needing to run a particular laptop with Windows 98. Indeed, it is a very risky situation since the laptop could break down at any moment. A possible solution would be to use a newer laptop with a USB to serial port adapter, which can be found for a reasonable price, and run Windows 98 inside a virtual box, which has the option to forward the host serial port to the guest. This way, you can use a new laptop with any operating system, including Ubuntu, and keep the Windows 98 partition nicely confined at uh, the part quite nicely confined without network access yes i did consider this and uh next time i get my eyes tested i might mention that to him actually thank you for that suggestion it's a great idea and andrew turner emailed did you in the pod listen to the recent the life scientific with professor dame wendy hall it was an especially good episode because professor dame wendy was interesting and jim al khalili is near perfect interviewer but also included a clip from hyperland wikipedia says hyperland is a 50 minute long documentary film about hypertext and surrounding technologies it was written by douglas adams and produced and directed by max whitby for bbc2 in 1990 it stars douglas adams as a computer user and tom baker with whom adams had already worked on doctor who with the personification of a software agent in hindsight what hyperland describes and predicts is an approximation of today's world wide web that must tick more boxes than you can fit into a tardis <laughs> No, Excellent. I did not see that. No. I will have to seek that out. Sounds interesting. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. To give us Tom Baker. <laughs> <laughs> in God, the is he in the room? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was just me. Wow. Doing this. <laughs> He's good at this. And finally, a moment Tony from Peter Kidd who listens while cycling. E. Each week you play a pre-recorded segment beginning, The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that enthralls, exasperates... The one thing that exasperates me is a segment that begins, The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. <laughs> Two reasons. One is the Wing Commander-like silly voice that I personally find really grating. The other is having to listen to it every week. It has become really irritating. I realise that you want to encourage feedback, but why not simply say, in a normal voice, something like, We truly welcome your feedback. Google UUPC to find all of our contact information. That's not normal. Sorry. We truly welcome your feedback. Google UPC to find all our contact information. End of story. 
anything longer just feels like unnecessary padding. Yeah, Tony. Unnecessary padding? Well, um, <laughs> we it allows did... us to have a sip of tea. We yeah. got bored to keep saying the same thing. <laughs> yeah, and people won't Google for our uh, details if we don't read them out in a very easy to use way um but we do truly welcome your feedback peter um and i'm glad to see you didn't have to google uepc for our contact information but we will be uh, sure to take it on board yes the ubuntu podcast needs you yes you if you hear something that enthralls exasperates or elevates you tweet at uupc or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org you can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. That's all for this episode. The next live show will be on Wednesday, the 20th of November at 00001 Galactic Standard Time. That's <laughs> half past eight in the evening for those of you in the UK. <laughs> wow, we scraped that barrel. <laughs> Galactic Standard Time. Is that what Tom Baker tells the time? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Right. Thank you for listening, everybody. We will see you next time. Bye. Bye, Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Bye.